Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This Hurricane Edition. I'm Juliet Antonio. And I'm Kevin the Dad. And if you're looking for some entertainment while the stormy weather hits, don't worry, we've got you covered with part two of our coverage of the essential Weird Al Yankovic. But before we dive into that, Dad, you have an announcement to make to one of our listeners, so yes. the floor is yours. Thank you. This is uh, to our loyal listener, Peg in Colorado. I uh, just wanted you to know, I haven't received a letter in a while. Uh, the mail service around here has been pretty poor as of late. <coughs> Louis DeJoy. Uh, yes. Um, but on the other hand, I'm thinking, well, maybe it's my turn. I don't know. Um, so if you want me to pick up a, a thread, um, let me know in the comments section below and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. And now on with the show. All right. On with the show. Hopefully we'll hear from you soon, Peg. Okay. Dad, is there anything we need to know about this section in particular? Or should we just dive into the songs? No, I think we covered everything in, uh, biographically in the, uh, first episode. So we're just going to jump right into disc two. All right. First song since you've been gone. All right. But if you do want another recap really quick, just go back and listen to the opening of part one and then come back and listen to the rest. Okay? Great. All right. So first song, Since You've Been Gone. And we have been gone for two weeks. If it wasn't for that ending, this would feel like the inverse of one more minute. Al is talking about all the pain he went through when this person wasn't in his life, which ranged from an ice cream headache to a cactus being shoved up his nose. But, plot twist, it was almost as bad as when this person was still here. I don't think this song stands apart from Al's previous I'm in so much misery over you songs, and I think this is a trope we can retire. As for the doo-wop, there's some impressive vocal scatting, but it feels like a carbon copy of One More Minute with a musical arrangement. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, this is an original, and I look at it as like an a cappella sequel of sorts to one more minute and also you don't love me anymore mm-hmm. i mean it's the same kind of same setup like she's gone al's in a buttload of pain and like you said it couldn't hurt anymore if you shoved a red hot cactus up my nose and so on and so on and so on like you said until we get to kick her at the end i feel almost as bad as i did when you were here ouch yes it's an okay song and it's short and yeah the the vocal arrangement is impressive so i'll, I'll mm-hmm. give him a pass okay it's al come on come on son come on Next track, Amish Paradise. I think sometimes the Amish get a bad rap. The assumption is that because they shun technology, they must be stupid. But they're far from it. They actually seem pretty nice. And they also manage to stay up to date with what's going on in the world, from COVID to Black Lives Matter, with one community protesting for BLM in the summer. And I guess with COVID in particular, a liaison from the government was sent down to the communities to let them know what was going on. So they're in the know and they're okay. Anyway... Ah, yes, the infamous parody that Coolio went from hating to kind of being okay with. Uh, But we really haven't heard from Coolio ever since his Hot Ones interview, so... Also, the parody where Weird Al managed to reference Prince without being sued. Hey! This is an example of a Weird Al parody where listening to the song is okay, but watching the music video is funny. There's Amish boys getting a thrill from an Amish porno mag where a lady shows her bare ankles, the frame of a house crashing when they're not told to stop pushing it, and a penis joke without churning butter with more fervor when a woman walks by. So my advice is, watch the music video, but give the experience of listening to the song by itself a pass. Huh. Yeah. I, I've never I've never seen the video. Watch it after this. Really? Yes. Okay. I I think it's even hilarious without the um without the visuals. So I'm expecting greatness. Uh yeah, this is a parody of Gangsta's Paradise by Coolio, which is based on Pastime Paradise by Stevie Wonder. Oh yeah, didn't he he got permission from Stevie, didn't he? When he recorded this? I think Lily Hirsch mentioned that in her book. Oh really? So he had, he went he went through the chain of command. I think so. I think they mentioned that Stevie Wonder was a little bit hesitant at first, but eventually gave him permission to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd never heard Coolio's song um, until now because I figured, all right, I should listen to the original. Listen to the original and the things I do for our fans. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely a very serious song, and um, I've also heard and I do have Stevie's song. I like Stevie's song better, probably because I've heard it more and it's original. And rap um, is not your forte, plus or minus a couple of groups. Well, you know, Run DMC, Run DMC. Beastie Boys. Mm-hmm. I'm very, very, very old school. <laughs> um, plus Al. Al, Al yes. has, has got legit skills. I was watching a, um, a reaction video to a song that we'll get to later. And oh, I think I know which one. The guy was just impressed with his flow. We'll talk about Al's cred a little bit later with one song in particular. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yes, this is Al's most controversial song in that, you know, 
He got permission from Coolio's label to record a parody, but not from Coolio himself. Mm. Though Coolio did get royalty payments. Oh. Um, well, he won in the end. And he wasn't too happy with it, but Al says, you know, they did make up at the 2006 Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, mm -hmm. but Al said he wasn't expecting a Christmas card from from Coolio. No. And, um, More like in a, well, like if I have to live with this, it's okay, I yeah. guess. And in a 2014 interview, Coolio said he was cocky and stupid and that he did consider Al's parody funny. And like you said, in 2016 on Hot Ones, he once again apologized. And I don't know if it was on the Hot Ones one or in the 2014 one, he was, his, his attitude was like, you know, the, the guy did Michael Jackson. I mean, Michael Jackson, who am I to, you know, say you can't do my stuff when he's done Michael's? Come on. Um, and the thing is, I would love to know what Stevie Wonder thought of thought of the parody. Um, as oh, that would be interesting. That would. As for the song itself, hilarious. Um, Al takes us through a day in the life of an Amish man. He has a plain wife, shuns electricity. Uh, he's hitching up a buggy. He's churning the butter, raising barns. But at night, they're going to party like it's 1699. So good for him for getting the Prince reference in there, finally. That's as close as to doing one of Prince's songs as he was ever going to get. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to do it now out of respect to Prince's legacy. Mm -hmm. And my favorite line is how Al is a million times as humble as thou art. <laughs> absolute, yeah, sure, buddy. Absolute genius. And yes, he does make a couple of um, Witness uh, references in there. But yes, I will go and watch the video now. For those who don't know, Witness is a famous film with Harrison Ford where he goes undercover pretending to be one of the Amish. He's what, police officer, FBI agent? Uh, police officer because um, an Amish uh, kid in the community has witnessed... Um, Oh my god, I saw the movie and I can't remember if it was a murder or probably a murder of some sort of crime committed. So I haven't seen the movie, but I've heard it's good, so I might check it out. Yeah, it is a good movie. Now before we move on, one question. Has Al parodied anything by Stevie Wonder or not yet? Um I it's possible. I really don't know. Um I'm sure uh alcoholics out there would probably uh probably let us know. Let me Google really quickly. Weird Al Stevie Wonder. Loading, 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 loading. Okay. Uh, no, the closest thing is Amish Paradise, so okay. noth n nothing like of Stevie Wonder specifically. So, mm -hmm. all right, well, the more you know. All right, next track, Gump. Oh, another skippable parody, which is sad. Listen, as far as a movie recap song goes, it's not one of Al's best. We'll get to one of his best later. I think he only picked Gump because it rhymes with Lump. More for a catchy chorus, but mm, not much. Makes for a catchy chorus, but not much else. The music video is rather ho-hum as well, with the only funny part being Forrest colliding into a pole while running and immediately passing out. But this is a song that's two minutes long that feels like it was cranked out in two minutes. Come on, Al, do better. Mm -hmm. I don't want to not like your stuff, but I didn't like it, man. Yeah, it's an okay song, and I think the thing is, it's like, if you listen to the original, there's a lot of not, there's not a lot of meat on the bones of it musically. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just very stripped down and very straightforward. And the original, it's... A very unusual song. Mm -hmm. um, and, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to admit, I have still not seen the movie Forrest Gump. I have. And I probably never will. <laughs> I mean, i got to keep the streak going. It's been 27 years so far, and this song is the closest I'll ever get. And, I mean, I know the movie just saturated the culture when it came out so i even without seeing the movie i get all the references mm -hmm. i mean i'll get some of the gumpisms about the box of chocolate and stupid is and stupid do, as stupid does and um Run forest run with the video yeah and about lieutenant dan mm -hmm. and bubba gump and all that i mean I, I get all the references without ever having seen the movie and i do like how the song ends sort of where he says and that's all i have to say about that and it ends I mean, it was because he really didn't know how to end this thing, but mm, yeah, it's, it's effective it's, ending. It's it's okay, and like I said, you know, I, I I will always turn to this rather than to ever see the movie. Movie fans, take that as you will. <laughs> yep, come come and get me. He doesn't care. He really doesn't. I don't. Next track, everything you know is wrong. I love this. So musically, Al has they might be giants down. Pat, down pat with a slightly nasal tone. Be I couldn't believe how much he sounded like the lead singers. As for the writing, I will admit I was being stupid. You see, I was trying to understand a song where the point of it is to not understand anything and to have fun and sing along. 
took me a few verses before I embraced the insanity and the absurdism of it all. I'm not even going to try to describe what happens in this song, other than by saying it's one inexplicable event after another. And as I say, if absurdism was a song, it would be this. Side note, I gotta listen to more They Might Be Giants music. I forgot how good their stuff was. Well, I do have the best of. I know. Okay. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure about the verses, but the Giants definitely could have come up with that chorus, no problem. They definitely could have. Yep. I mean, even the title sounds like one of their songs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the verses are surreal. Like, at one point, Al goes into the kitchen for Golden Graham cereal, which I haven't had in a long time. Love that stuff. What is Golden Graham cereal? It's, it's, it's a graham cracker tasting cereal. It's really good. But it's one of these things where it's like you you can't pour milk on it because it gets soggy real fast. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah. Oh, I don't I don't think I've seen that at the grocery stores in a while. Like I'm looking at like the box of cereal and mm -hmm. Google Images and I'm like, I haven't seen that. That company I used to work at used to sell its old its own version by this company called Three Sisters. And oh my god, it was so good. It was better than the original Golden Grams. Well, anyway, no, you'll just have to settle for the original. <laughs> and anyway, we're, we're getting way off the track. So Al goes into the kitchen for Golden Grams, winds up slipping into an alternate dimension where the aliens all look like Jamie Farr, who played Max Klinger in MASH. For those yeah, of you I googled it after. Too young. MASH um, is gaining popularity with my generation now, really? actually. Yeah, it's one of those shows that, you know, never feels dated. It's about, you know... Unfortunately, my generation can relate to, you know, America always being involved in a foreign war. Mm -hmm. But also, the writing's really good. We appreciate the good writing. And it's got popularity on TikTok right now, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a catchy song. I love it. And like you said, they have, the band has They Might Be Giants down perfectly. And I'm going to say it again, that band just deserves a lot of respect. They do. And not just for the adult content that they made, but for the kid content that they made for... Uh, Playhouse Disney when I was a kid. No, I'm talking about Al's band. Oh, Al's band does deserve credit. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Especially Bermuda, who's been their drummer since... Since the beginning. Since, since another beginning. one rides the bus, where he yeah. talked himself into, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. You rock, Bermuda. All right. Next track. The Night Santa Went Crazy. Extra gory version. Okay. This reminds me of a clickhole quiz that I took on clickhole.com, where Santa has a prostate problem, and you're assigned with the task of keeping it a secret from the media. It's the most bizarre quiz, and my sides hurt from laughing. So what I want to know is, why hasn't this song become a dark Christmas classic like Father Christmas by the Kinks? I'd love it if this played on the radio every December along with Andy Williams and that King Cole. So the premise of this is that Santa finally snapped held the elves hostage, slaughtered all the reindeer, and was eventually brought down by the SWAT team. Although, if we're going to be accurate, it'd probably be a SEAL team. And I have to say, Santa isn't the one who's getting a bad deal. It's the elves. Like, okay, this is assuming that Santa is real. Sorry for any kids who are listening. Oh, God. But... It's the elves' labor that's used to make the toys, but like any other CEO, Santa swoops in and takes all the credit. While the uh, and while the elves aren't compensated adequately, and they're separated from the value of their labor, and do they even get insurance or the right to unionize? They, Who the hell knows? They're like the Oompa Loompas of Christmas. Pretty much. So while this song is great, I think someone needs to write "The Day the Elves Went on Strike" to stick it to the big guy for sitting on his butt and eating milk and cookies. That would be a fun premise for a kid's book, too. I would. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an original in the style of Black Gold by Soul Asylum, which I didn't realize that until I read it, and I thought, oh, my God, they've got that down perfectly. Mm -hmm. So Al's label wanted him to do a Christmas album for a cash grab, and Al said no. Mm -hmm. But in 1986, he came up with Christmas at Ground Zero, which was definitely an anti-Christmas song, like yeah. just, you know, getting nuked, um, which Al says he can't play live nowadays because everyone associates Ground Zero with 9-11. Yeah. Um, in 1996, he came up with this gem, and there are two versions. Really? This one, as you noted, is the extra gory version, mm -hmm. which first appeared on the Amish Paradise CD single. Mm. And anyway, uh, the premise is that Santa totally loses it one year, because the reason is he's sick of getting milk and cookies as a reward for all his work, for his delivery services, because obviously he's not making the toys. Meanwhile, what are the elves getting? Food and shelter? We hope. We hope. We don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so he ends up destroying half the North Pole, kills some of the reindeer, holds the elves hostage. Um, Santa gets killed by a SWAT team, but in the original... He's serving time in a federal prison for 700 years. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. And Mrs. C winds up negotiating the movie rights. 
Good for her. <laughs> Good for you, Mrs. Claus. But yeah, this was another one where Al, you know, just decide, you know, I'm going to make something, a Christmas song, just so terrible, like, lyric-wise, so, so violent, so anti-Christmas that the label will still leave me alone. And we loved it. Of, uh, you know, trying to get him to make a Christmas album. Hey, better than Blue Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> For that episode, see our Christmas special. <laughs> All right, next track, your horoscope for today. This reminds me of an excellent series on TikTok where two people who know nothing about astrology give you your horoscope. Sometimes they're surprisingly poignant, but almost all of them are downright bizarre. Al's song is definitely poking fun at the people who take astrology to heart and to a fault, making each horoscope either bizarre or ending horribly for the reader. Al's horoscope for me, a Gemini, is, quote, Your birthday party will be ruined once again by explosive flatulence. Your love life will run into trouble when your fiancé hurls a javelin through your chest. I laugh because it's all good fun. As for astrology itself, I think it can be fun as well and is something that you can use to guide you if you wish, but you shouldn't let it dictate your life. Sure, your fate may be up to the stars, but I believe the universe responds to the choices we make accordingly. So remember that you control your destiny, or if you prefer, what you'll read in your horoscope tomorrow. And fun fact, I found this out a couple of days after listening to this song. Horoscopes gained in popularity after the 1930s when someone made one for Princess Margaret for her birthday. And everyone was like, what's this? I want one. And that's how they became popular. So we have horoscopes because someone gave it to a princess one time as a gift. Oh, jeez. Yep. Mm, thanks, royal family. <laughs> so this is another original in a, in a ska style, so you can dance to it. Um, Al nails how ridiculous horoscopes are, and I'm a Pisces, so I need to avoid Virgos and Leos with Ebola. And I am also the true lord of the dance, no matter what those idiots at work say. Well, you're married to a Leo, but she doesn't have Ebola yet. That's true. Mm. So, I, I, horoscope-wise, I've made up pretty well. <laughs> and Al does this for every other sign as well in the song. And then he gets to the heart of the matter, which I am quoting in, in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Now, you may find it inconceivable or at the very least a bit unlikely that the relative position of the planets and stars could have a special deep significance or meaning that exclusively applies only to you. But let me give you my assurance that these forecasts and predictions are all based on solid scientific documented evidence. So you would have to be some kind of moron not to realize that every single one of them is absolutely true. Everybody got that? So, yeah, your fate does depend upon a bunch of rocks whirling in space. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. Balls of gas burning miles away. Pumba, with you, everything's gas. <laughs> so it's it, it's a very peppy song. Like I said, you, you can dance to it, and it's, it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. All right, next track. It's all about the Pentiums. Pentiums, according to Google, are microprocessors found in computers made by the Intel Corporation. For me, this song is hilarious if you pretend that it's the theme, so theme song to the TV show Mr. Robot with Rami Malek and Christian Slater. All the Mr. Robot fans are just, like, facepalming right now. Anyway, other than that, the song doesn't have much of an effect on me, mostly because I'm not familiar with the original song by Puff Daddy and because I don't know the tech jargon. But I also think it's because people who know computers really well aren't mocked as they once were on TV shows like the IT crowd or even in songs like this. Then again, Al does have a great rebuttal coming from the people who know computers really well, but it feels tacked on at the last minute. So to all the techno wizards out there, this one is for you, not for me. Uh -huh. Yep, this is this is a parody of It's All About the Benjamins by Puff Daddy. And yes, I YouTubed it because I had never heard the original. Me neither. And I had to go on. And so the song's going along, going along, going along and in the video. And then it turns into a tap dance battle between Puff and Xavier Glover. That sounds interesting. It's It just is so left field. Obviously, Xavier Glover wins this, but I guess Puff figured, well, you know... I got these tap dance lessons from when I was six, so my mom probably spent a lot of money on them, and I need to pay. Make it worth make it, a while. Make it worth. Yep. Yep. But um, anyway, once again, Al did his research to the point where this song still holds up today, mm -hmm. where he talks about, you know, you know, your computer is like, you know, a week old, then, you know, it's already out of date, and on and on and on. Um, the band kills it, and once again... Al can rap. Mm -hmm. And I will say again, he's just so underrated in that area. And my favorite line is, if I ever meet you, I'll control or delete you. Absolute genius. And then the next song is also genius. The saga begins. 
Once again, Weird Al makes the Star Wars movies sound a lot better than they are, especially with The Phantom Menace, which is mm -hmm. impressive considering Al hadn't seen the movie when he wrote the song, and the only information he obtained was through online forums. The way Al describes the basic plot and story with Don McLean's music, you're thinking to yourself, Wow, this sounds great! I want to watch the movie now! And then you pop the DVD you found in the 99 cent bin into the player, and are really underwhelmed. So Al's job has worked a little too well. But one of the reasons this parody works is that American Pie has a melancholic tone about it, as it describes the mood surrounding Buddy Holly's death, in the first part of the song at least. And Al uses that melancholia to describe Obi-Wan's emotions after watching Qui-Gon Jinn get murdered right in front of him, and promising he'll continue his master's teachings with Anakin. He also had stuff in the song that you wish was actually in the movie too, like Qui-Gon telling Yoda to go stick it in his pointy ear. In conclusion, this is the only Star Wars related media I will consume on May the 4th, before watching Star Trek movies out of spite. And maybe one day, when the Star Wars fandom gets its shit together and Al is up for it, he can finally release that Star Wars album we don't deserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is definitely a parody of American Pie by Don McLean. And to me, this song is the best thing those god-awful Star Wars prequels begat. And mm -hmm. Al sums up the Phantom Menace in five minutes. It's painless, it's fun, and you don't have to sit there for like two hours plus like watching the movie. And I remember seeing it with your mom and we were like so excited, like, oh, this is going to be so great. And then we got out and we we're like, what the heck was that? Yeah, I'm sorry. That was just awful. And I know the kid who played it again had a rough time. and That poor kid. That poor kid, yeah. He didn't deserve it because he didn't write the damn thing. No. I'm sure he did the best he could. It was just a job. Given the material that he was presented. Mm -hmm. That same thing with Hayden Christensen later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who actually can act if you see the movie Shattered Glass. He's excellent in a lot of other movies. And he's coming back to play uh, Darth Vader in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series on Disney+. Plus. Hmm. So people are like, oh my god, he'll play Darth Vader and the writing will be good. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Don McLean said that his kids played this song so much that when Don performed American Pie in concert, he'd sometimes catch himself singing Al's lyrics. Not that the audience minded. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure they didn't. They were like, "All right, we like this version too." We're getting two songs instead of one. But yeah, I love this, Al. Thank you so much. I wish you had done this for the other two crappy prequels. It would have definitely saved me and the wife a, a lot of time in the movie theater and her they were just they were just awful revenge of the sith is the best one out of them was that the third one that's the third the one. best part was when like he's becoming darth vader and his legs are getting burned off and he's in that lava thing or whatever like wow this is intense this mm -hmm. is really you know why won't the rest of these movies like this this is like awesome mm -hmm. all right next track albuquerque al has an incredibly important talent of making songs that are over five minutes not feel like five minutes mm -hmm. because his writing captures your interest and he's a master of pacing and comedic timing. The story of the song is that Al is trapped in his mother's basement being force-fed sauerkraut every day until he wins a contest by co coming the closest to guessing the number of molecules in Leonard Nimoy's butt, which allows him to go on his dream vacation to Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's where he finds true love with Zelda, a calligraphy enthusiast, after she notices he has weasels biting his face off. He has two children, eventually divorces because his wife wants to join the Columbia Record Club, which is a joke I still don't get. And he's not ready for that kind of commitment. Columbia Record Club was very popular in the 70s and early 80s where you would sign up and you would get like so many records free, f not free, but you would get like eight records for eight records or eight, eight tracks or eight cassettes for a dollar. Mm -hmm. But then you were committed for so many years for buying an album a month from them at oh. these regular exorbitant prices. Hmm. So that was like, are you ready for that kind of commitment to get those eight albums up front for like a buck? Mm -hmm. You know, you had to see it through. To the end. Because if you, if you didn't honor the commitment, then there were penalties or fees or something. Oh, geez. All right. And then Al gets a job at the Sizzler. And the moral of the story, Al hates sauerkraut. That's it. Oh, and also, if you have an existential crisis, just know that there's a magical place called Albuquerque. It is so batshit insane that it is brilliant. Yes, but the pillows are oh so fluffy. <laughs> That's all I really have to say about the song, since the music speaks for itself. But I did want to share two facts I found fascinating. 
One, we never did find out how many molecules were in Leonard Nimoy's butt before he died, which was actually posted on Reddit when he died. R.I.P. Leonard Nimoy, we never found out how many molecules were in your butt. We only know that Al was off by three. And two, there's actually a story behind why hotels place chocolates on your pillow. Allegedly, back in the 1950s, Cary Grant wanted to have a romantic rendezvous with someone who was not his wife. He thought it would be cute if he had a trail of chocolates going from his sitting room in his penthouse all the way to the pillow on his bed. The hotel manager found out about this and started placing chocolates on guest pillows. So thanks to adultery, we have a quirky little custom. I guess. The more you know. I've never come across that yet. I've been staying at the wrong hotels. Mm -hmm. Um... This, okay, this is another original in the style of a band called The Rugburns, which I've never heard of, but Al saw them at the Hollywood Troubadour and came up with this song soon after. Great name. Eleven and a half minutes of strangeness, but once again, like you said, it just does not seem that long because you're just like so involved in what is going on plot-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Al's going through a series of adventures, my favorite being that he's the only survivor of a horrific plane crash because he was the only one who had his ta- tray table up and his seat back in the full upright position. Mm-hmm. So listen to the stewardesses when they tell you these things. Seriously, do they don't mess around. Yep, and my other favorite thing is the, the whole donut shop episode where... You got any bear claws? Ooh, you got any this? You got any that? Ooh, let me go check. No, we're, we're out of bear, bear claws. claws. But he does wind up with a box of one dozen starving weasels that start gnawing on his face. Mm-hmm. And the whole point of the song, like you said, is he just hates it's sauerkraut, sauerkraut. Which I thought it was that in Albuquerque, you have fluffy pillows. Mm-hmm. And my other favorite part of the song that I want to highlight really quickly is when he saws off the, that guy's arms and legs. He goes, but now he has a cute nickname, Torso Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Always makes me lose and it. And the guy who said he he didn't have a bite, mm-hmm. didn't have a bite to eat, so he go he rips out his jugular. Mm-hmm. Which hey, some people have no sense of humor. Yeah. Next track, eBay. The Backstreet Boys brought this up when they did a reaction video for the Fine Brothers. Really? Yeah, you can't find it, though, anymore. The Fine Brothers deleted some of their stuff, and I don't know why. Mm. Most of the members of the group like the parody. The only one who didn't was Nick Carter. So I guess that means the song gets an 80% approval rating from the band. I don't see why he didn't like it, though. The song isn't making fun of the original. It's just going off about a guy who has an online shopping addiction. And since I've been raised in the era of the internet, I wanted to ask, was online shopping looked on as stupid back in the day? Because I know most people prefer it to shopping in stores nowadays. Um, I don't know. I mean, before it was online shopping, there was, well, I guess they're still around QVC and Home mm-hmm. Shopping Network, where you watch, you're sitting in front of the TV, you watch, and you have your phone at the ready. Mm-hmm. Smart or landline, doesn't matter. And you call in and purchase things that you don't need. Okay. However, while judging Al for shopping on eBay would be snooty, we can judge him for the crap he decides to get. I think the only things I'd buy from that list are the Pac-Man lunchbox and the toaster, because, hey, you can always use a good toaster. I think everyone who impulse buys can relate to this song, and I have to give credit to Al for singing in five-part harmony, because that's a feat to pull off well. Also, nice little dig at the vibrato of boy band singers at the end. Perfect finishing touch. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. Um... Yeah, like you said, it's a parody of I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys, who should be thankful because this is the only version of this song I will listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Al's house is full of crap because it was on eBay. Mm-hmm. My favorite's being Shatner's toupee and Kleenex used by Dr. Dre and more stuff that he just really thinks he needs. And I like how he talks about he's going to snipe you at the last second mm-hmm. just to get in there. I've done that once or twice. Um it's it's fall down funny. It's hilarious. Great, great, great parody overall. Yeah. Next, Bob. Bob. What do you get when you write a song made entirely of palindromes? A spoof of Bob Dylan. Genius! I already knew a little bit about this song from the Lily Hirsch book, but also from the documentary on the World Palindrome Competition, which I enjoyed, but I don't think Mom did, because let's face it, most of those palindromes didn't make much sense. They may be fun to write, but it's hard to make a good one that people find funny, which is why I was bummed that the lady who won second, uh, that the lady won second place in the documentary, she should have won first. Because hers was very concise. Yep. This song makes me chuckle because Al nailed Bob. Not only the whining tone of voice, but also the little vocal tics that are so unique. Bob, for example, always ending a sentence with an upward inflection. 
And I can so see Bob singing this, which makes me wonder. Imagine what those suicidal poets who showed up at his door would have thought of this song. Probably would have tried to find some deep meaning while Bob laughed his ass off all the way down to the bank. Musically, I think Al nailed the arrangement as the song progressed, because at first it sounds like a bit of a bluegrass tune, but that's just me being nitpicky. And I think it's safe to say, if you are a fan of Bob, or if you're not a fan of Bob, you will love this song either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an original in the style of Bob Dylan, specifically subterranean subterranean homesick blues hmm. and so al like you said he wanted to do a song made up of palindromes which are words and sentences that read the same backwards as forwards so al strings them all together looks at them and realizes oh my god they sound like bob dylan lyrics mm -hmm. which they do they do they do um especially circa um uh bringing it all back home um, Highway 61 Revisited. Yeah, Blonde it sounds like Blonde, a Highway 61 Revisited Right song. in that wheelhouse. Absolutely perfect. Um, and the video is great. Yep. Al parodies Dylan and Don't Look Back, specifically the cue card scene that he did for Subterranean Homesick Blues. So he's got the palindrome on every single card. This is absolute genius, and I hope Bob Dylan himself has heard this. Oh, I hope Bob has a sense of humor. I really do. Next track, Hardware Store. Yeah, that is like, hmm, I think I found a new co-writer. <laughs> Next track, Hardware Store. I bow before Al's rapping abilities. Yes. Busta Rhymes is quaking. Because Al is able to list off tools at lightning speed while harmonizing. Obviously, he doesn't sing all those harmonies at once, but it's still impressive. Just shows this guy's passion for all things hardware. This song is also an example of how you can make anything an instrument, which Al does with hammers, chainsaws, and all sorts of tools that make perfect no that make noise in perfect time with the instruments. And the thing is, he keeps it consistent throughout the entire song. Yep. I think this song is growing on me the more and more I'm able to appreciate how much effort Al put into a song about a seemingly trivial topic, but hey, that's what makes the man so great. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's an original, and it's like nothing's happening in Al's town until he finds out that the Home Depot slash Lowe's is going to be opening soon, mm -hmm. and he camps out overnight to be the first person in there, and he nails the experience, no pun intended, perfectly, right down to the random promo of every 27th customer gets a free ball-peen hammer. Did that happen at the safety shop? The safety shop? Yeah. No, we didn't ever have a grand opening. They'd already been in business for like almost 100 years. No, but did they have like customer specials or anything while you were no, there? No, oh, okay. no, I mean, we're talking like a big box store that can afford to like give oh, away do that, yeah. like crappy tools. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, then he goes into the rap about all the stuff they got. And the speed of his rap is jaw-droppingly impressive, which I don't know if he did it all at once because you don't hear any pauses for breath. Mm -hmm. or if it was just all edited together. Either way, it doesn't matter. It's it's a piece of audio genius. And for me, he gets bonus points for giving a shout-out to soffit panels. And I'm not going to tell you what those are. You need to Google it. It's S-O-F-F-I-T panels. So go Google Lowe's, and you'll learn something. Soffit at Lowe's. Apparently Lowe's has some uh, things. Oh, I've seen soffit panels before, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. You have to Google them yourself. Thank you. No problem. Like when we got the house redone, mm -hmm. um, Dave Marshall was big on the soffit panels. Oh, really? He was. Huh. Yep. Hi, Dave, if you're out there. Probably not. Anyway, next track. I'll sue ya. Oh, no. I'll sue you. I'll sue you. I'll, I'll, I'll counter sue. I'll counter sue that counter suing. Anyway. anyway, Chief Justice John Marshall wrote in his opinion for Marbury v. Madison that in the United States of America, if you feel your rights have been violated, you are entitled to a legal remedy. What I think he was aware of, though, was that someday idiots were going to exploit the legal system to its fullest, such as the subject of Al's song, who sues companies as a result of his own stupidity. Almost all of these cases involve civil law, which is disputes between two individuals, rather than criminal law, disputes between an individual and the state. But I think most tort and malpractice judges would have the sense to throw these bogus cases out of court because they're a waste of time. And just listening to Al whine about why he should get this money grates on my nerves, just shut up and don't be a moron. Well, you know, it just hit me right this second. I think this is um, a response, possibly, to that woman who sued McDonald's. The McDonald's case, yeah. Because she got the hot cup of coffee and it spilled in her lap. Mm -hmm. And her, 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 her logic was, well, they didn't have a warning to let me know it was going to be hot. Well, it and turns out her lawyer exploited her a little bit and really? pushed her to sue McDonald's, yeah. But they won, though, huh? They won. Hence this song. Uh, this is original in the style of Rage Against the Machine, who is like, 
one of the world's most sincere and angriest bands. And they get their comeuppance in this song. And for any one of their fans who's complaining, why is Rage Against the Machine political? One of them has a poli-sci degree. Of course they're going to be political. Take that, Paul Ryan. Rage Against the Machine is his favorite band. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I guess, I, I guess that way they can say, hey, see, Ma, I did something with my degree. Mm-hmm. And like you said, Al sues every major company for ridiculous reasons. Dell, his laptop doesn't work in the bath. Taco Bell, he ate a million chalupas and got fat, and so on and so on and so on. And to me, he has one legit suit. Which one? Neiman Marcus. They're getting sued for putting up Christmas decorations way out of season. That's not a legitimate lawsuit. I can relate to that. Come on, as soon as like as soon as Labor Day is over, Christmas decorations everywhere. It's like that. It's like that Toy Story meme. meme, Christmas decorations. Christmas decorations everywhere. You see that pop up after Halloween on Facebook a lot. Oh, I hate that. And then my my other favorite is he sues Ben Affleck. Oh, do I even need a reason? And when, when Affleck falls. The demon must rise, and when the demon falls, the Affleck must rise, which we're seeing now. <laughs> yeah, Affleck's on the rise again, isn't he? Yeah. And Damon's falling because of that interview he did. Oh yeah, okay. Couldn't yeah. Yep. Anyway. <laughs> and yet again, yet again, the band is tight, and I gotta admit, Al does a darn good Zach De La Rocha impression. I'm sure Rage was not happy with this because they are achingly sincere. They are. Ugh. Well, at least you know where they stand. Lighten up. <laughs> Just lighten up, people. Thank you. They're not going to, Dad. That's They're the whole gonna. ethos. And if you don't like it, listen to something else. Next track, Canadian I'll Idiot. I'll go listen to Al, Al sing I'll Sue You. <laughs> Canadian Idiot. Man, listening to the song in the midst of Justin Trudeau calling a snap election sure is interesting. Yeah, so basically, for those who aren't familiar with a parliamentary system of government, what the prime minister can do is if they feel like their party has an edge and they can gain some seats, they can call a snap election. And uh, I'm so sorry, Canada. I'm really sorry. Anyway, Al goes from griping about Canada and how stupid their customs are to realizing it may not be all that bad. I mean, they have Celine Dion and health care for crying out loud. But according to my friend Jaden, hi, dude, if you're listening, Canadian health care is meh. Not perfect, but meh. But one thing's for sure, it's better than the clusterfuck here in the U.S. Anyway, I think one reason I enjoy songs that poke fun at other countries is because it makes me think about our U.S. cultural customs that other countries perceive as odd. Some countries are definitely better than others in terms of quality of life, but we all have our little quirks that we love and hate. Only in Jaden's case it's hate because he wants to move to Australia or New Zealand. So I just want to say, Jaden, sorry about your government and what your prime minister's doing right now. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, this is a parody of American Idiot by Green Day, obviously. Yep. You know, those bear swilling hockey nut Canadians. Oh, sure, they've got national health care, low crime rates, and clean air, but they also have Celine Dion. <laughs> <laughs> God. Hey, you, you know, said so like, yourself. She can sing. It's just the material that she's given. I, I will say she does an unbelievable version of You Shook Me All Night Long. Mm-hmm. I was just suitably impressed. Celine, just keep going in that direction because... You got the chops for it. You really do. Mm-hmm. So, um, where was I? Um, Canadian idiot. Yeah, and I got to say, there was something that surprised me. Um, this song came on my uh, came on in the car on my iPod, mm-hmm. and I'm listening to it. and I thought, oh my god, I didn't think I had American Idiot on my iPod. <laughs> Cause, no, because the being at the beginning, they are just so spot on. Yeah, they are. And then as soon as Al opened his mouth, I realized. Oh, oh okay. yeah. Yep. But they just kill it. They're perfect. And my favorite part, though, is at the end, where no one kind of sees this coming. Where at the end, Al says, they've got to be up to something. So before they see it coming, time for a preemptive strike. Which brought me back to American Heritage Magazine voting Canada as the United States' most underrated enemy. Because we tried twice to annex them in our past, the American Revolution and the War of 1812, and we failed both times. Didn't work. Didn't work. And it probably never will work. No. Nope. So it's like they're polite, but you got to keep an eye on them. We also kind of can't afford to, uh, you know, provoke hostilities off. with Canada because of the uh, NAFTA agreement with uh, the Mexico and with Canada. Oh, I thought you were going to say because they have the nice bomb and they will use it on us. Plus, also, we need their hockey players. We do. 
we kind of do. But also, one quick fun fact about Canada you may not have known. When uh, America was going to declare independence from Great Britain, they actually wrote letters to all the other colonies. And they said, hey, you want to join us? And Canada said, nah, we're good. And another thing about those Canadians, they don't bring their guns to the mall. What's wrong with them? (laughs) That's also in the song. Anyway, next track, Pancreas. This sounds like a song that the group Da Vinci's Notebook would do. They're the ones who sang the song Enormous, and they also wrote the song The Sneak for HomestarRunner.com. As for the song itself, well, the musical arrangement is okay, it's just that Al doesn't write anything particularly interesting about the human pancreas. Granted, it's a wonderful thing when the function is the reason that most of us don't need to inject insulin every day. At least half the song uh, with the overlapping lyrics made me bob my head a little bit, but I don't think this is the song out of all Al's originals that most people want to play on full blast. He may have felt the need to write the song, but I don't feel the need to listen to it. Oof, I am coming from a clip completely opposite direction from you. Uh, This is an original in the style of Brian Wilson slash Beach Boys circa Pet Sounds, Good Vibrations, Surf's Up era. And per the American Heritage Dictionary, the pancreas is a gland behind the stomach that secretes pancreatic juice into the duodenum, which is the beginning portion of the small intestine. Yes, I did my research. Mm -hmm. And insulin, glucagon, and some somatostatin into the bloodstream. So it's very, very important. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to get pancreatic cancer because if you do, you're screwed. Yeah, you are. And once again, Al obviously has done his homework, both with his pancreatic research and the song's arrangement. Very intricate and multi-pot, and it works well. It's tuneful and educational. And I think the reason Al might have picked the pancreas is because it's one of those things everyone's heard of and no one has any idea what it does. Mm, that's true. So You can use songs to educate people. Yeah, so it's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. I learned something. And I think the arrangement is brilliant. I mean, it's just so, like I said, it's just so intricate. And the band really did its work. It's just, it's just amazing. I'm impressive. I'm impressed by it. And I'm sure Brian Wilson's probably impressed, too, if he's ever heard it. All right. Next track. Don't download this song. Oh, please do. Remember those ads that scared the crap out of kids about pirating DVDs? The ones that begin with, you wouldn't steal a car. This feels almost like a gentler version of that. I feel like this is Al mocking those ads because no one listened to them because of how exaggerated they were. And also with the musical arrangement, this sounds like when celebrities came together to record We Are the World or Don't They Know It's Christmas with the big sound and the powerful vocals. Plus, the artists are already rich. Obviously, this song is outdated now that most of us listen to our music on streaming services such as Apple Music, Pandora, or Spotify, but it does make you nostalgic for some of the more creative ways we acquired music. Shout out to the LimeWire reference. Oh, and Al, joke's on you. I'm not paying for this song because I listened to it on YouTube Music with Firefox's ad block on, so that's a few less cents in your piggy bank. But you're well off already, so who cares? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the original in the style of every damn charity song. And it starts off with that sincere horn intro, because you got to have one of those. Mm-hmm. And then, like all charity songs, we get lectured. Yeah. And so, in this case, downloading will lead to robbing liquor stores, selling crack, and running over school kids with your car. And the, IR, the RIAA will sue you, and you'll wind up in jail like Tommy Chong, who took a hit for his son. It was something to do with DVDs. Um... I really couldn't get into the like particulars of it. Oh, yeah, and he went to jail instead of his son. He, yeah, he took the bullet for his son. And as a father, let me just say... You're not going to do that. I am not going to be someone's prison bitch for you, as much as I love you. Well, I won't, I won't lead the kind of life that makes me go to prison anyway, so you're good. Okay, loyal listeners out there, you heard it. You heard my daughter say she is not going to live that lifestyle. So if mm-hmm. she does, I am totally justified in my actions. <laughs> and I got to say, like all charity songs... The chorus is catchy. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's an all-around terrific parody, and the best part is on the fade-out when Al yells, You cheap bastard. But there's one thing that this song doesn't have, which all charity songs do. It doesn't have the unfortunate part of all the money going to the wrong people. (laughs) Watch Poverty, Inc., and shout-out to Huey Lewis for not doing World Aid because he knew that the money... for doing Live Aid because he knew the money wasn't going to go to the people who needed it. Well, they have... they, they, they have been some charity songs, I don't know if you could call it a charity, where it's like a social consciousness raising thing, like the one that Miami Steve Van Zandt put together called Sun City, where he had um, an impressive lineup 
with all these artists coming out and saying that they were not going to play Sun City because it was a whites-only resort in South Africa at the time mm -hmm. when apartheid was going on. Because there were bands that had played there and got a lot of shit for it, like, unfortunately, Queen. Oh, shit. Linda Ronstadt. Freddie, you're from Zanzibar. Why? Mm -hmm. Wait, was this after he died or before? Oh, this was before. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um... So yeah, that was that was a big deal back in the uh, back in the eighties. But yeah, there was, as far as I know, there wasn't any um, any uh, money involved. And Al, like I said in part one, originally I, I borrowed the uh, discs from the library and downloaded them. But then I realized I really needed a hard copy in my life. So we also pay for the library with our taxes. No, this was Seekonk Library. I have to pay. Oh. I have to pay to join every year. So there's a membership fee involved. Okay, so so in the way, I am there. I am paying yep. for you know. And if you are an artist hoping to write a charity song, either do it to your race social consciousness, or if you are going to donate money, make sure it is going to the people who need it. And there are a list of charities out there where the money does go directly to the people and businesses that are on the ground. So, just to quote Sherlock, do your research. All right, next track. White and nerdy. Oh, seeing Donny Osmond dancing in that <laughs> music video gave me Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcode flashbacks. And it's that one time he had to turn on the TV and Donny Osmond was performing some sort of song. And, you know, it's Nana's house. I want to be polite and, I'm, and I don't want to tell her to change the channel. But on the inside, I'm going, make it stop. Make it stop. Was this before or after Joseph? This was after Joseph. Oh, okay. Because he was doing, like, I think he was doing Shut Up and Dance with me. And I was like, no, no. Please no. Anyway, I really like this parody, and I think it's fair to say that after all his rap parodies, Al has some street cred. Maybe not a lot, but some. Enough. And in this song, he ticks off a lot of white and nerdy boxes. AV Club, Chess Club, Glee Club, Dungeons and Dragons, always puts mayo on his sandwiches, can't choose between Kirk and Picard, has an action figure collection, does calculus for fun, and my personal favorite, fluent in JavaScript and Klingon. This song was definitely written in the days where being a nerd wasn't cool, but now with nerds being in the mainstream, this feels like even more of a love letter, which nerds like me appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is a parody of Raiden, originally called Raiden Dirty, by Chameleon Air. And yes, I listened to the original, cops are just trying to catch Chameleon Air, Raiden Dirty. And interesting video, check it out when you get a chance. As for Al, he's white, nerdy, and embraces it. He's a D&D cha &D champion. My favorite is MC Escher is his favorite MC. Uh, he knows Pi to a thousand places and so on, and the only question that's ever stumped him, does he like Kirk or Picard? Hands down a classic. His rapping skills are not to be denied. And the video is just incredible. And after I watched the video, I watched a reaction to a video, and this guy was just stunned. And he picked up things in that video that I never would have focused in on, like the way Al mows his lawn, like just the way he's got the walk. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, one of the one of the uh, viewers in the comment section below loved how Key and Peel are mm -hmm. in the convertible, and even though they're in the convertible, they actually lock the doors yes. so Al can't get in. Because they don't want him crimping on their style. No way. And then when he pulls up with the Segway, and he he waves at them, and they both flip him off, and he gives him the tisk tisk sign. Mm -hmm. Hysterical, stone cold classic. Yeah. All right. Final track, and. The icing on the cake, trapped in the drive-thru. Oh my god. I feel like we as a society are at a point where more people know the Weird Al parody than the R. Kelly original. To which I say, thank god. Especially with R. Kelly being in the news again recently. What did he do now? Well, because he's in court. Oh, it's finally brought it, up to trial? Yeah, he's in court now. It's taken this long. Wow. Well, th because of the new cases that emerged against him anyway. You remember the Gail King interview where he basically threw a temper tantrum? It, he's in court right now. Uh. So, yeah. <laughs> Makes me think of that episode of The Boondocks. Oh, man. Oh, yes. <laughs> we got to still watch that show. Anyway, the premise of this parody is that Al and his wife can't agree on where to go for dinner, so they go to the drive through Everyone who's been in a relationship or who's been in a family can relate to the beginning of the song where no one can decide on what they want to eat. I mean, what do you want to eat? I don't know. You? I don't know. It's something we do almost every Friday. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There's also moments people in customer service can relate to with that one customer who shares way too much. Mister, that's way more than I needed to know. However, there's a few hijinks where the lady at the window gets their order wrong at first with the size of the root beer. Al forgets his wallet. And when he does get his burger, he can't believe they forgot the onions. 
This description makes the song sound boring, but it is a 10 minute masterpiece that doesn't feel like 10 minutes, and it leans into the unnecessary drum of the music so it feels operatic, especially the parts where the wife has something in her teeth, and also when they get in the car, turn the key in the ignition, drive down the street, and get in line because Al pays painstaking attention to detail. He also manages to find intensity in the silly moments, such as when the wife wants a chicken sandwich and the husband moans that he doesn't know who she is anymore. And the song is also surging in popularity because a sample of it's being used on TikTok. Well, he looks at me, and I, I look, look at, at him. him. Well, he looks at me, and I look at him. With hilarious results, with one of the best ones involving somebody staring at this Jeff Goldblum shower curtain that their roommate put up in the apartment. No, that does not exist. It does exist. Do you need one in our bathroom? No, I'm good. I love the man, but not that much. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Easily one of Al's best parodies of all time, and I'm glad it's getting so much love. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, so since this is a parody of Trapped in the Closet by R. Kelly, what did I have to do? But I had to track down the original because I never heard the song before. Oh, no. And it turned out the song has 22 chapters. Video-wise, they're all uh, like about three minutes long. Oh. So I watched chapter one, which was unintentionally hilarious. Mm-hmm. And then chapter two, which was more so. It's just so over-the-top ridiculous, this situation that he's gotten himself into. You cannot take it seriously, even though I think that's his intent. Mm-hmm. It just, the video just kind of kills it. Um, but yeah, 22 chapters, and after the second one, I thought, I think I'm good. I'm done. I don't really need to know how this turns out, because I went to chapter 22 and watched a couple of seconds, and it just seems to get bigger and bigger, and it's someone else's story. Mm -hmm. um, this also contains a slice of Led Zeppelin's Black Dog, mm -hmm. which just comes out of nowhere. It's great. Um, Al's version is intentionally hilarious and scary, especially when they get to the drive through and it turns out... They do not take credit cards. It's cash only. Which we've all had that moment at some point. How ridiculous is that? For a drive through yeah. And you're trapped because car's in front of you, car's behind you. What do you do? Mm -hmm. And Al and the wife are scrambling for cash, for change, for anything they can find. Mm -hmm. And they have to put some of the menu items back because... Al's wife saying, well, I'm really not that hungry. You can put the chicken sandwich back and let's just please get out of here. And, yeah, he takes, like, the most mundane situation and just gets so much drama out of it. You're sitting there and you have to find out what happens next. And this song is, like, 10 plus, maybe almost 11 minutes long. 10 minutes, 56 seconds. And it just does not feel that long because you no. are so caught up in what's going on mm -hmm. and for me that ending is just sad yeah. all that work and no onions on and the no onions on his burger and in the music video they do the single tear that comes down the eye as the animated character bites into the burger i i love i love the 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 video it's it's a cartoon it's mm -hmm. almost borderline family guy animation but like maybe a step or two below that it's older yeah, uh, the best part was there is, um, is when they instantly straighten out their hair that got blown out from listening to Black Dog on the radio because mm -hmm. you just turn it on, and the hair just gets all frizzed up, mm -hmm. and all I have to do is just two hands up, pat it down, and it's back to the style that it was. If only it was that easy. In if real only life. people with naturally curly hair are crying. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, this song is way, way better than Trapped in the Closet. Mm -hmm. Thank it's, God. It's, it's a masterpiece. It's just, and I'm going to say it again, it's genius. Absolute genius. And a perfect note to end on. Yes. All right. Overall, I'm really glad we took two episodes to cover Weird Al's best of. He's easily one of the most universally beloved musicians in recent times. He's someone who chooses to make us laugh for a full-time profession, and we owe him a debt of gratitude. Thanks for the music, Al. We're so glad you didn't become an architect. And go read Lily Hirsch's book, Weird Al Seriously. It's definitely worth your time. Go get a copy from your local library mm -hmm. or buy it. Um, this compilation lives up to the title. It is essential. And like I said in part one, Al handpicked every song himself, so you can trust it. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing on this from Al Apocalypse or Mandatory Fun because those two albums, which turned out to be his last two, mm -hmm. um, Mandatory Fun final two. Yeah, they came out when I was in high school. In 2014. 
Um, those both came out after this collection, but that's how it goes. Um, I wish that Ward, Ward Crimes was on here, but I can just always watch the video. Mm -hmm. That song is perfect. And your mom, Al, if you're listening, which you're probably not, my wife did point out that towards the end of the song, you do split an infinitive, and it drives her nuts. She is an, she, I married an English major. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, again, if you, if, you need to, if you don't have any Al in your life, you absolutely need this compilation, and after that, you're on your own. And all I can say is, Al in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame 2022, not just Al, but him and the band. The they, band deserves it. Like I said before, I mean, good God, James Taylor's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Just get I mean, Al in there. Come on. It's past Al, due. It is way past due. He's been eligible since 2004, I believe. So let, let's get him in there. Let's get cracking. There's got to be a petition online or something, I hope. There is. Okay. Let's go sign it after this. We will. All right. And on that note, thank you for listening to Lace and Stillman and my dad listens to this. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. If you're friends with my dad, just say what episode you want, and he'll email it directly to your inbox. Thank you for listening. We'll be back with another album to nitpick and gripe about. And hopefully, maybe one day when we're recording this show, Al will finally be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Here's hoping. See ya. And Al, don't sue us. Please don't. Bye.